Once upon a time, there was a little girl, Nell, and her grandfather, who had a shop, an old curiosity shop. They fell into debt and had to give up their shop and home. Nell and her grandfather were forced to leave the city for a life of begging in the countryside. They wandered about for many months, suffering great hardships and pursued by heartless creditors. At last, they found a haven in a cottage beside a village church. Just as a rich relation was about to reach them, little Nell, worn out by her troubles, died. The story was published in serial form in 1841. As it moved to its tragic climax, its author was inundated with imploring letters recommending poor little Nell to mercy. Waiting crowds at a New York pier shouted to an incoming vessel, is little Nell dead? She is dead, the captain called back from the bridge, and a wave of shock and grief spread through the city. Little Nell and her grandfather did not exist until they were dreamt up by their creator, Dickens. The painting shows Charles Dickens surrounded by the characters he bodied forth in 20 novels to affect the lives of tens of millions of other human beings around the world. The painting is called Dickens's Dream. The great object of life, said Byron, is sensation, to feel that we exist, even though in pain. On the island of Pentecost in Melanesia, land divers, as young as eight years old, leap from hundred-foot towers. The tower bends, the rope stretches. It catches them inches before certain death. Why do they do it? Some among them will say that they do it to make the yams grow better. The ceremony is part of a great harvest festival to increase the output of their fields. But I doubt that a single inhabitant of Pentecost believes that. The ritual has to do with human growth, not yams. Every youth who leaps has grown that much larger in himself. He's understood what it feels like to take enormous risks, to fly to fall, to have his body wrenched back from destruction. And those are things that those who don't jump never know. The more someone has been through for himself, the more he'll understand of other people's problems. Then is there a connection between wide personal experience and social wisdom? For thousands of years, the connection has been made. Individuals are revered as teachers, diviners, doctors, because they personally have run the whole gamut of experience. They are often called shamans. In theory, at least, they're individuals who've suffered every conceivable kind of human trauma and thus can see by the light of their own experience further and deeper than any ordinary man. A shaman must go through a process of initiation. He must experience pain and sickness. Sometimes he must change sex or even change his species so that he becomes familiar with everything a man may have to go through in this world or the next. But all 
almost always, as well as or as a substitute for such terrifying bodily ordeals, the initiate must undertake dream journeys, where in a state of trance or ecstasy, he confronts demons, makes spirit allies, dies and is reborn. Here in the rainforest of Amazonia, a young Yanamama Indian is about to undergo initiation. He's taken potent drugs to launch him on his journey. Now for two days, while he sits in a state of stupor, the elder shamans will act out the drama that's going on inside his head. The dream must follow a set course. His guide leads him on, introducing him to the spirits of death, warfare, sickness, envy, madness. <laughs> It's done in public. Not only the other shamans, but lay members of the village watch on and check his progress, so that no one can doubt that the initiation is going the way it should. This is the spirit of the evil Koemari bird. Its tongue is dry, its eyes roll in their sockets. For the initiate, weakened by hunger and half crazed by the drugs, the encounter is almost more than he can take. But let no one doubt that it will be effective. He's traveling to and beyond the boundaries of human experience. And as a result of his trials and visions, he'll come back as a wise man, a seer, someone with first-hand experience of the psychic world. Now, when he has to solve a problem, he'll know where to go. What is the cure for this child's sickness? The shaman will ask the spirits who are making him ill. The child has dysentery. He's severely dehydrated, and his soul is about to be taken from him. The shaman himself becomes the patient and fights the sick child's battles for him. Does it work? It certainly works as an idea. And though in practice, many of the claims of shamans may be phony, the philosophy that lies behind it makes deep sense. Long ago, perhaps as long ago as 20,000 years, people recognized the strength that comes to men through having explored the length and breadth of human feeling for themselves. Has shamanism vanished from our culture? At first sight, it seems that Western culture neither encourages nor recognizes the power of psychological initiations, let alone does it lay any emphasis on the role of the dream journey, who today, among us, experiences the state of trance, or lets themselves be pushed or pulled along the path of other people's dreams. A night at the theater may seem a far cry from the Amazonian forest. But let's look again at what goes on. Certainly, it all seems much more decent and more civilized. Even the drugs here aren't so potent. Yet what is about to happen 
if it's not some kind of ritual submission to a dream. A theatre, simply as a place, is something special. A temple-like building, totally separate in style and mood from the city streets outside. We've been ushered into the sanctum by uniformed attendants, all gilt and plush. Programs, drinks, this animated chatter, they're all part of the ritual. It's as though we've, as it were, been softened up, given the pre-medication which precedes the operation on our minds. Behind the curtain, something's stirring. This side, we're being counted out. All these people that I'm here with, how peculiar that we're all in this together. So, this is what we've come for. To sit in the dark and let ourselves become absorbed in a dream world. A world of kings and princes, madness, incest, ghosts. For the next two hours, no one in this audience is going to move or speak. It's as though, just as if we were genuinely dreaming, our bodies have become temporarily disconnected from our minds. But however slack our bodies may become, we'll soon become in mind, a part of the action on the stage. Now, Mother, what's the matter? Hamlet, thou hast thy father much offended. Mother, you have my father much offended. Come, come, you answer with an idle tongue. Go, go, you question with a wicked tongue. Why, how now, Hamlet? What's the matter now? Have you forgot me? No, by the rude, not so. You are the queen, your husband's brother's wife, and would it were not so, you are my mother. Nay, then, I'll set those to you that can speak. Come, come! Sit you down. You shall not budge. You go not till I set you up a glass where you may see the inmost part of you. What will I do? Thou wilt not murder me. Help! Help! Oh! It's like a dream. A rat! A rat! And yet in one way it's quite different. If it were a dream, we ourselves would be up there in the thick of it. Dreams are first-person fantasies. We're in our dreams and play an active part in them. The things that happen, happen directly to ourselves or to people to whom we feel ourselves connected. But here we can't be more than mere spectators. One thing's for sure, we ourselves aren't present in this story. Let me wring your heart. Then why should we feel ourselves in any way involved with the fate of these two strangers on the stage? What have I done? That thou darest wag thy tongue in noise so rude against me. Such an act that blurs the grace and blush of modesty, calls virtue hypocrite, takes off the rose from the fair forehead of an innocent love, and sets a blister there that makes marriage vows as false as Dicer's oaths. Why me, what act that roars so loud and thunders in the index? Look upon this picture. And on this, the counterfeit presentment of two brothers. See what a grace was seated on this brow. Hyperion's curls, the front of Jove himself, and I like Mars to threaten and command a station like the herald Mercury new lighted on a heaven-kissing hill. Combination and a form, indeed, where every god did seem to set his seal to give the world assurance of a man. This was your husband. Look here. What follows? Here is your husband, like a mildewed ear blasting his wholesome brother. Have you eyes? Could you... On this fair mountain, leave to feed and batten on this moor. Have, have you eyes? Can I, call it love? I am involved. I find myself worrying about Hamlet. One moment egging him on, the next wishing he'd hold back. Where is thy blood? Oh, Hamlet, speak no more. Thou turnst my eyes into my very soul, 
and there I see such black and grained spots as will not leave their tinct. Nay, but to live in the rank sweat of an inseamed bed, stewed in corruption, honeying and making love over the nasty sty. And speak to me no more. These words like daggers enter in mine ears. No more sweet Hamlet. A murderer! But can he put his mother through such mental torture? A slave that is is not Hamlet the mad? He's killed Ophelia's father and doesn't seem to care. Sometimes he seems amazingly self-centered, obsessed with the purity of his own soul. What must it feel like to be so bent on vengeance? No more. And yet, and yet, let's be clear, I couldn't ask any of those questions unless something rather strange was happening to me. Hamlet and the Queen mean nothing to me, really. But what is? Really? Save me! Hover on me with your wings, you heavenly guard! What would your gracious figure? Alas, he's mad. Do you not come, your tardy son, to chide that lapse in time and passion lets go by the important acting of your dread command? Oh, say! How is it with you, lady? Alas, how is it with you? That you do bend your eye on vacancy and with the incorporal air do hold discourse. To whom do you speak this? Do you see nothing there? Nothing at all, yet all that is, I see. Now, did you nothing here? No, nothing but ourselves. Look, where he goes! Look how it steals away my father in his habit as he lived! Look you where he goes, even now, out at the portal. This is the very coinage of your brain. This bodiless creation ecstasy is very cunning in. Ecstasy? My pulse as yours. Hamlet is a play about illusions. But perhaps the strangest illusion of the lot is the one that you and I are under, the illusion that this kind of dramatic fiction has any relevance to us. Extraordinarily, late in the 20th century, it's an illusion that we go on living by. Shakespeare may not be everyone's taste in entertainment, but the fact is that our culture is as dream-bound as any there has ever been. We are strange creatures, human beings. Given the chance, we'll spend the best part of our spare time outside ourselves. Five hours a night before a television screen. The lives of total strangers, actors, politicians, TV personalities, can become as important to us as our own. Maybe the things we want from life are still much what they always were. But some things radically changed. Animals are concerned with living their own lives, looking after themselves or their own kin. But we human beings have spread the net of our concern so wide that now it seems we do a large part of our living at second hand. The great apes, it's true, lead complex social lives. Quite likely, they are even conscious. But one thing gorillas don't do is to create a world of fantasy gorillas. They don't tell each other stories or act plays. That's obvious. What's not so obvious, at least to a biologist, is why we do. I'll tell you why I think we do. As human beings, living in the most complex societies the world has ever seen, we need every ounce of human experience we can get. To survive in society, we have to be natural psychologists with insight into all sorts and conditions of other human beings. Shamanism was, I think, a surprising and ingenious answer. In the past, we picked on special individuals and trained them as a culture to experience the world on our behalf. But now, the process of initiation has become democratized. Now we've found ways of letting everyone share in the spoils. What the arts, painting, plays, films, books can do is to provide anyone with ever greater opportunities for entering, quite literally, into the spirit of other people's lives. Take painting. We walk in off the London streets, and what confronts us? Within a few steps, we've entered, if we will, a psychological treasure house. 
a gallery in large part dedicated to the exploration of what it feels like to be human. In Rubens's Samson and Delilah, the painter shows Delilah in the act of betrayal, still caressing her slumbering lover as his potency is cut away. Here in this gallery are men and women brought to our attention at the most critical and secret moments of their lives. Christ taking leave of his mother. The Arnolfini marriage. Belshazzar's feast. the execution of Lady Jane Grey. It's all housed in a palatial building, the equal of any seat of government or law or commerce. No one can say we underestimate the worth of shared experience. The temples to the arts are at the center of our culture, not only spiritually, but geographically and architecturally. There have been parallel developments in every major civilization in the world. China, India, Africa. But for us in the West, the ground for the performing arts was laid in ancient Greece. This theater at Epidaurus, built two and a half thousand years ago, held 15,000 people. They would come at the spring festival and bivouac in camps around. And now by the light Greek the tragedies, such as the Aristia by Aeschylus, deal with every sort of violent emotion. A king's country. treacherous murder by his wife, the son's revenge killing of his own mother. The women of Athens, girls, mothers, old women, come as a glorious group in procession. Drape our honored guest strangers in robes of deep sea red and lead them with torchlight held up before you so that these furies who turned out so kindly will reside and show love and bless Athens forever. At the end of the play, there are, of course, political and moral lessons to be learned. But from the time when plays like this were first put on, philosophers debated their more purely psychological effects. Audiences like it. They wouldn't come otherwise. But the fact that people get pleasure from a spectacle like this does not explain their deeper motives. Stand and be silent while the kind, the kind ones, ones pass. Stand. Stand and be silent while the kind ones pass. Go to your home, children of night, honored with music and torchlight. Stand and, and be, be silent, silent while the kind ones, ones pass. Go to your home, underground and primeval, honored by sacrifice. Aristotle laid great emphasis on what he called catharsis. In watching a play, we purge ourselves of dammed up feelings. It's a way of, as it were, taking emotional exercise and working off emotional energies in a controlled way. Now echo our chorus, raise your own cry. Even today, catharsis is often thought to be one of the chief functions of the drama. Yet to suppose that that's all there is to people's emotional involvement is, I think, completely to underestimate the psychological education it provides. Now echo our chorus, raise your own cry.
what plays and books can do is to show us things we never knew before. Not least things we didn't even know about ourselves. The Chinese sage Lin Shu said this of books. People in a book become at once my nearest and dearest relations. When they're in difficulties, I fall into despair. When they're successful, I am triumphant. I'm no longer a human being, but a puppet whom the author dangles on his strings. John Fowles is one of the master puppeteers. Does he think that novels can expand the reader's psychological horizons? I think this is an important function of a novel, really to give sort of dry runs uh, for real life situations. And also the novel, which really is a kind of heightened journalism, which simply reports um, uh, on a culture, or on how people behave in a culture. And I, of course, it's not only a novel, but I would say all art, um, in fact, does do what you suggest. It, it really is giving psychological lessons, even if they're only in terms of reporting how people actually behave. The novel can provide lessons in psychology, but where does the inspiration for it come from? Does the creator of a work of fiction have to be a special sort of person, someone who's open to experience in ways that other people aren't? Perhaps Fowles himself does see his own role as that of a sort of elder shaman, whose job is to guide us novices along dream paths that he's already trodden for himself. Well, I think the parallel is fairly close, really, and perhaps not least in the fact that we don't really understand why we do what we do. And perhaps the added fact that the people who do understand what we're doing, the, many of the critics and the academic theorists, something strange about them, I've always felt, is that they can't produce novels themselves. So there has to be a sense in which I think almost all novelists are slightly possessed by something they don't understand. And that does bring us close to the, I imagine, to the um, sense in which you're using Sherman. All novelists have to be adolescents. You're condemned, in fact, even at my age, to being part of you as an adolescent. I get that with my own contemporaries now. I feel they're much uh, older and more mature than I am. Um, but something in you has to stay very young and uh, open, really, to a much wider world than I think most of my sort of contemporary friends, in fact, know. Um, you, ha you have to really um, feel free to all stages of your own life. And also, of course, in terms of the characters you're imagining. You really have to live your characters until they become more real than reality. This happens in the first stage of novel writing. Um, you have to have such a deep interest in, in what you're doing that uh, it completely subordinates actual reality around you. And this can, on occasion, uh, become an almost trance-like state. I've suddenly wept over things I've written myself. Uh, but I think you'd find that's true of uh, almost all novelists. You're so moved by what you've written that you, you actually do feel uh, water in your eyes. I mean, that's certainly a physical um, symptom that I've noticed. But uh, you, it's simply that you have to get yourself in that peculiar state, I think, in order to produce the goods. Very often when you come to, when you're revising, you may, you may turn it down and uh, keep it down. But something in readers um, wants that feeling of, of intense emotional reality, in, in my own belief. Um, and it's really the, the art of getting that emotional reality across, which produces the kind of book they they themselves will have, obviously, weaker 
a reflection of, of that feeling you had when you were doing this first draft. All night, Dickens said, I have been pursued by little Nell, and this morning I am unrefreshed and miserable. I'm breaking my heart over this story. Dickens's skill lay in getting that emotional reality across. This is what he wrote in the novel. If there be any who have never known the blank that follows death, the weary void, if there be any who have not known this and proved it by their own experience, they can never faintly guess how, for many days, the old man pined and moped away the time. But how many of those readers waiting on the New York Pier had previously known it and proved it by their own experience? And yet they cried. For the effect of Dickens's writing was precisely to make the old man's loss their own. Dickens himself was midwife to the very sense of desolation he described. India has her own traditions of literature and drama. But here in Madras, as everywhere in the 20th century, it's with films rather than theatre that the techniques for forwarding experience have really come into their own, bringing people closer than human beings have ever been to the full possibilities of a shared dream. To us in the West, the themes of Indian films may seem impenetrable. Yet in film after film, the stories confront the emotional realities of Indian life. Caste barriers, religious bigotry, arranged marriages, the tension between wealth and squalor. Does the fiction of the cinema do the same psychological job as books and plays? Here is the British director, Carol Rice. You recognize things that are either in you, and therefore they, they confirm or, or reveal things to you, or fiction gives you news. It gives you emotional news about how people feel or how they behave that you didn't know before. And that's very, I mean, it's just good fun, you know, to, to, be, um, to be learning. <laughs> Rice's most recent picture is a love story centered on the country singer Patsy Cline. It's called Sweet Dreams. Your lover said goodbye, I said to the moon of Kentucky, keep on a shine. The film is unpretentious, made for a wide audience. But on its own level, it is powerful. More than a slice of life, wrote a critic, a cut of emotional truth. We take the film to ourselves personally. Let's see how it is that a film can so affect us. The cinema can do it um, in a particularly persuasive way because it can take you into what Eisenstein used to call the position of the ideal spectator. Let's say you can stage a scene um, and then put the spectator into it. You can make the spectator see it, first from the point of view of one protagonist, then from the other, or start seeing them both. In other words, the camera can always put you into the most advantageous place for making you feel inside it. Yeah, damn, woman, you're good. I mean, that bitch can say. I don't know if you remember Take me now. Walk. No, listen to me. I really like the way you... Hey, I don't know what song. you think you were doing while I was trying to sing. What do you think? That's funny? Well, I was listening. Yeah, I don't like the way you listen. Take a walk. The way the thing works is that people get together in a dark room 
and everything else is excluded. So there is a direct attempt to make a world for you. The film makes a world for us. But who inhabits it? Here, very early on, we're being given crucial information about character. Look, I came over here to explain. Oh, to apologize to you for messing you up a while ago. I was just enjoying you singing so much. Now that I get a good look at Patsy Klein, she don't look so hot to me anyway. And I don't care if you have something on some half-assed television program. You don't sing that good. You ever listen to a Kitty Wells record real close? You go home and slit your goddamn throat. <laughs> You reveal characters to the audience by what they do and what they say. If a fellow gets rejected and he walks away and kicks the table, well, that says something about him. Um, if uh, a fellow, instead of applauding the lady, turns to the audience and says, that bitch can sing, that says something about him. Of course, every little bit contributes to the character. But I'm not going to tear this thing to pieces and tear off all its wings and describe to you how it's done. Well, maybe Rice, like any good conjurer, won't tell us how it's done. But the fact is, the magic works. Seven to seven? Well, last week at the high school, you said you wanted to buy me a drink. I want a seven to seven. A minute ago, we knew nothing about these two, had no interest in them and no expectations. Well, you got the advantage on me. You know my name, but I don't know yours. Charlie. Charlie Dick. Dick? <laughs> oh, Charlie Dick? That's right. It's a story of a, a marriage, um, a, a very good marriage. They really, they love each other and they, they, they're, they're very much interested each, in each other. The thing never goes dead. But it's very spiky and uh, they bash each other around, both physically and in other ways. A year or two later, Patsy is pregnant and about to give birth any day. Charlie has been given leave from the army to be with her. Why don't you get out from under our feet? Go buy yourself a beer or something. Oh. All right, if that's what you think I should do. Yeah. Dinner's at six. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning before you go. No, I got to get going. You all, you all have a good night. Come on. It's been real nice. I'll see you before I go. All right. Hi, Charlie. What? Nothing. What? <laughs> Why your hair is off? <laughs> you look so different with short hair. So? So, I think it's kind of cute. I like it. Rice mentioned how we, the audience, are put by the camera in the position of the ideal spectator. All those good times we had. <laughs> yeah, I remember. But what the camera does, the structure of the screenplay can do to even more effect. We follow Charlie behind Patsy's back. And it's surely the fact that Patsy's not seeing this that makes us worry for her. You know, I've always liked you, Charlie. Going to Carol's house. Come on, Charlie. Let's get out of here. Get the father around so I can get the rest of this information from him. A moment later, the tables have been turned. Now we, knowing more than Charlie does, may perhaps become concerned for him. He'll be here soon. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> I tried not to editorialize about the two characters. I tried not to say who is the good one and who's the bad one. And I hope that the audience remains open. That is to say, for one moment, they should think that Charlie Dick is a monster. And next moment, they should think, yes, but wouldn't I have done the same thing? And yes, but isn't it? very understandable that he doesn't equally with patsy you've never changed a shitty diaper in your life between mama and madrine and me patsy and charlie have had an argument at the fair she's taken a lift home with a stranger on a motorbike they took their time but nothing happened between them and we from our godlike position of the ideal spectator 
know that nothing happened. Charlie doesn't. You laid down for that guy now? Don't ask. I'm asking, Slut. Yes, I did. I did. And it was great. It was so great. It was wonderful. It was better than it's ever been with you. We're going to get married, Mr. Motorcycle Man and me. Imagine how differently we'd view this scene if we, like Charlie, could think she'd really been unfaithful. You try and keep the audience's feelings open. You try to surprise them. You try to make the next event throw a different shaft of light on the character so that you are actually, hopefully, surprising the audience. And if they believe you, if the actors and you persuade them that it's the truth, then I think the audience probably learns a great deal about, for one thing, about the contradictor, about the, the, co the contradictoriness of one's own feelings. I've got your picture that you gave to me. The film has given us the chance to explore the meaning of the Patsy Charlie marriage for ourselves. Hey, whoa, Charlie! to try out their respective roles, to respond with sympathy or with contempt. What do you want, Charlie? I want to talk to you. It's all right, man. And maybe, again from that ideal position, to see how impossible it is to get it right. Oh, God, Charlie, don't. I'm sorry. I will never raise a hand to you again, I swear it. By this stage, I have to say that I myself have taken sides. I find myself almost as if I was Patsy's brother, willing her not to give way. I don't know, Charlie. It's a small point, maybe, but I don't think I have, in fact, ever felt that way about any of my real-life sisters. The film has taught me something new about myself. If you want a definite answer right this minute, the answer is no. I don't know if I can live with you anymore. What at one level is just an entertainment, at another is a cut of emotional truth. The film works, and it works because we never doubt that this actress, Jessica Lang, is Patsy Cline. Acting is obviously quite as important as writing or direction. But so too is something else. Not so much the way the actress plays the part as the kind of person the actress is in her own right. There is an element of personality peeking through the characterization, which is very important in the movies. The audience wants to Put it another way, the star, the person who really draws the audience's interest, doesn't necessarily have to be a great actor or great actress. What they do have to be is appealing. They have to be good company. They have to be people that you'd want to be around. Or they have to be people who can astonish you. You, you, you have to feel that they're capable of doing bigger things than you can do yourself, therefore they can embody your wishes in a way. It's an interesting question, and surprisingly, very little is known. What is this elusive thing, star quality? Sex appeal, quite simply, is often a large part of it. We may not consciously be looking for a mate, yet mating is never very far from people's thoughts, and as potential mates, these men and women promise more than most. Physical beauty can make softies of the best of us. But there is, of course, more to it than that. There are certain people who have a more subtle psychological appeal. Yes. We need them, but what's interesting is that they suggest in all sorts of ways that they need us. Such people seem not to be quite sure of their own boundaries, 
the limits to where they end and other separate human beings begin. They themselves are unfinished, incomplete. It's a quality that, for obvious biological reasons, is possessed in the simplest and most innocent form by children. With adults, it's more rare. But when this kind of charm does carry through to adulthood, it often seems to rest on a childlike quality of immaturity and openness, coupled to an ambiguous or enigmatic presentation of the self. Chaplin as the little guy in need of a friend. Garbo is the woman whom everybody else gets wrong. Brando as the husky, perpetually pubertal lad still surprised by the intensity and intelligence of his own feelings. Monroe is the sexual ingenue who needs protecting from other men's, other than ours, that is, designs on her. Monroe was packaged to suit pre-existing tastes. James Dean took people by surprise. People talk about the chemistry of a relationship. Dean was a highly charged iron restless and incomplete. He appeared in only three films, but his impact was immediate and enduring. All the releases were there. A baby face, that weak jaw, the androgynous quality that made him sexually provocative to men as well as women. Such people can, for better or worse, exert a powerful hold on popular imagination. The cinema more than any other dramatic medium, has the capacity to lure us into meaningful relationships with strangers. The opportunities for psychological discovery are there, but how, in the end, are they being used? The danger is that the whole thing becomes self-defeating. Instead of helping us lead richer lives in the real world, the drama becomes an escape from the real world, or takes us up side alleys that have little or nothing to do with natural human feeling. This herring girl has been offered a choice between her own egg and a gigantic wooden one. Ethologists call the gigantic egg a super stimulus, and the fact is that the mother gull prefers the fake. Having been set up by nature, to seek human experience by whatever means we can, are we too now beginning to fall for sterile dummies? I think you make good choice. No one can say that Rambo as a film does not address great themes, love, courage, warfare. Yet Rambo is surely not a conscious human being. He behaves occasionally in human ways, one moment he's showing love behavior, the next killing behavior. <laughs> Rambo himself, however, has no real feelings, and we're unlikely to have any about him. I don't think a film like Rambo does a lot of harm. What it fails to do is good. We live at a time when not to do good may well be to do harm. It's only 10 years since the United States was fighting a real war in Vietnam. It's been said that there's no great truth of which the opposite is not also a great truth. The truth is that the culture that raises us up might bring us down. For 2,000 years or more, human beings everywhere have been developing and expanding the human capacity to undertake dream journeys. Our own culture, more than any, has universalized this process. No wise men, no shamans of the past, have had the opportunities that we have for exploring the length and breadth of human feeling. <laughs>